I was always asking what if, and that's in science fiction, that's the question. What if this could happen? What if this could happen? You're not satisfied with, with the now and uh, with the way things are. You want to imagine something wilder and more exciting. And uh, in time, I started imagining things that have, in many cases, stuff that I wrote about have come to pass 20 or 30 years later that I was just sort of goofing on before. A lot of, I've written a lot about genetics, which is something that's been a lifelong passion, interest. And a lot of that now, you know, even a little bit about genetics, you know, we can just do almost, just about anything, <laughs> scarily, but excitingly too. Um, and a psychological way to answer that question is that, um, that writing about the fantastic allow, allows you to put a little distance to things that you may be not sure about, that you may be embarrassed about, that um, you may want to explore, but you can always say, well, that's not me. This time on the Plutopia podcast, we take a break from the real world and venture into one of our favorite neighborhoods, the world of fantasy and science fiction. Author Michael Blumlein visited Austin recently, giving a reading from his latest book, all I Ever Dreamed. Later, Michael was joined by fellow author Chris Brown for an engaging discussion about his life and work. We let Chris do the introduction. Good afternoon. Thank you all for fighting your way through the marathon to come for what will not be a marathon of uh, uh, on a lovely Sunday afternoon here at Malvern Books. Um, it's my great, great pleasure to welcome my friend Michael Blumline to Austin. Uh, uh, Michael Blumline is a World Fantasy Stoker and Tip Tree Award nominated writer who's produced a, a remarkable body of fantastic fiction while also maintaining a practice as a physician, uh, mostly running a university medical clinic for the urban poor in San Francisco's Mission District over a period of decades, uh, and raising a family with his third grandchild on the way. Uh, Michael first came on the scene and when I first encountered him in the 1980s when science fiction had one of its most fertile periods as a, as a home for writers interested in using the sort of generic toolkit in service of, of perhaps more avant-garde aspirations. And in Michael's case, aspirations that coupled the profound humanism of a physician devoted to the underserved the kind of unblinking honesty of a clinician who sort of sees the disease for what it is and calls it as he sees it, and the urgent yearning for political justice of uh, someone who came of age as a 60s radical. Uh, Michael's first published story, Tissue Ablation and Variant Regeneration, a case report, uh, published in the uh, kind of seminal Ballardian journal Interzone in 1984, is a kind of great example of the, of the marriage of these themes. It's a story that the science fiction encyclopedia, uh, John Clute called, quote, one of the most astonishingly savage political assaults ever published, in which a team of doctors eviscerate the living body of Ronald Reagan with, without anesthetic, uh, partly to punish him for the evils he's inflicted upon the world, and partly to feed the world with foodstuffs generated from those tissues. The body of work Michael has uh, produced in the subsequent decades includes the novels and novellas The Movement of Mountains, XY, and The Healer, and the collections The Brains of Rats, The Roberts, What the Doctor Ordered, All I Ever Dreamed, and Thoreau's Microscope, the last two of which both came out last year. Uh, his latest uh, is a novella, Longer, uh, something that's even more sort of authentically science fictional in a way that I'm very excited to have him sharing with the world, which we'll talk about a little bit. And that's forthcoming from Tor.com, uh, the science fiction, one of the science fiction imprints of the Macmillan in, uh, this April. Um, lastly, I just know that science fiction, it's provided a home for the work of Michael Blumline, but his work is really its own sort of unique genre. Um, to quote again from the science fiction encyclopedia, at his best, Blumline writes tales in which, with an air of remote sang froid, he makes unrelenting assaults on public issues and figures. Even the opaque serenity of works like The Healer can be understood as asking hard questions about what it means to heal in a fallen word. 
world. He writes as though his aesthetic demands justice, as though, in other words, beauty demands truth. It's really beautiful and compelling work. Michael is going to read from some, and then I'm excited to get to talk to him about it a little bit. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much, Chris, and thank you all for coming. I'm, I'm here pretty much because of Chris. We met, I don't know, how long, 10 years ago or yeah, last five, ten, five, 10 years ago, and uh, he came to San Francisco a couple of years ago pub when uh, Tropic of Kansas came out. And uh, we hatched this idea, well, he would read at a bookstore and then I would have a conversation with him. And uh, some old Austinites who live in San Francisco came out. It was really fun. And so I thought, well, why not do that in reverse? And he said, come on out. And, and I've never been to Austin and this always wanted to. So I'm really thrilled to be here. Thank you all for coming. I'm going to read today from my, uh, my new collection, which came out last year, All I Ever Dreamed. And the title is kind of a double entendre. The stories are 30 years worth of everything that I could ever think of, everything that I dreamed or that I wanted to write about. And the collection itself, being able to have all my work of three decades collected in one place f that doesn't go out of print, what, what bigger dream could you have? So it's really a wonderful um, event. When you put a, uh, a collection together of 30 years of your life, you can't help but think about the stories that you've been writing for 30 years and seeing them in sometimes new ways and, and reflecting on what you've, what have been your prevailing issues and themes over the years. And for me, the, the things I've consistently written about are science and the ethical, challenges and dilemmas that science faces, particularly medical science. I've written about this a lot and faced it in my day-to-day -day practice. Gender has always been something that I am fascinated by, how we know what gender we are. What does that even mean, what gender, and how fluid gender is, and and I wrote a number of stories about that many years ago, and I thought I kind of had finished, sort of said my piece. And then my newest, uh, this, is a, this is the new one that's coming out in uh, May. Here it is back again. So obviously that's still with me. The human body is something that I've always been um, in love with and on every level in love with just having a body of my own and seeing what it's capable of and incapable of. And of course, taking care of other bodies and other minds. And this has been an incredible privilege for me, an incredible source of inspiration throughout my whole career as both a doctor and a writer. I noticed, I didn't really notice, but in looking over however many 18 or 20 stories in this book, many of my stories have to do with the, these themes about science, about ethics, about the body, and a number of stories, at least four or five, are fairy tales, are tall tales, fables. And I've written in here, there's a story called Paul and Me, which is about Paul Bunyan, kind of. There's a story called Snow and Dirt, which is sort of a mashup of Sleeping Beauty and Snow White, kind of. Um, and today I'm going to read one that is my version of the Pygmalion myth. Do people know the Pygmalion myth? If everyone nods. Pygmalion was a, uh, a sculptor who, who made a, a sculptor of this idealized woman, that he, and he fell in love with this marble statue. Um, and Aphrodite eventually granted him the gift of, he, she brought the statue to life. 
in my story, there are consequences to these kind of wishes being com coming true. In the myth of, that Ovid wrote about and people before, there were no consequences. This is, uh, this is the story, the Pygmalion story, that ultimately became My Fair Lady, the uh, musical. And so anyway, I'm going to read just the beginning from my story called The Roberts, and it kind of melds some of the stuff I've been talking about, a little bit of medicine, a little bit of science. And the other prevailing theme that I actually should mention is love and relationships, because every story, it, it was amazing to me, every story I'm trying to figure out what it takes to have a successful marriage of two people. And I keep coming back to that over and over at different times in my life, and, the, and, and it changes depending on what, when I'm writing about it. But it never goes away. And here's, here's a, uh, another attempt at figuring out how to, make a, how to make love work. Long before Grace, before Claire and Felicity, before the two men who wrecked his life, there was him and him alone, Robert Fairchild, first and only child of June and Lawrence, warm and cozy in his mother's womb. He was two weeks overdue at birth as though reluctant to leave that precious, corpuscular, sharply scented, deeply calming place, determined to remain attached. When at last his mother, weary of a tenacity that at other less pressing times she would come to admire, served notice and forced him out, young Robert, shocked and indignant, cried a storm. His father was a physicist, an academic devoted to his work, highly respected and rarely at home. Robert was raised by his mother who adored him, and he learned, as many sons do, that love bears the face and the stamp of a woman. He excelled in school and following in the footstep of his father chose mathematics as a career. But midway through college, he was bitten by another bug and abandoned math for art. First painting, which poured proved beyond his grasp, then sculpture which tantalized him. Sadly, his work was never more than mediocre. Some of it, by any standard his own included, was out and out ugly. And these were not the days when ugly was beautiful. These were the days when beautiful was beautiful and beauty reigned supreme. His failure was discouraging all the more because he expected to succeed, as he had all his life until then. He lost confidence in himself, a new experience, and on the heels of that, his spirit spiraled down. Eventually, he decided to drop out of school, but on the way to deliver his letter of resignation, he ran into a fellow student, literally collided with her. She was standing at the edge of the sidewalk, a sketch pad open, a pencil in hand, utterly absorbed in the rendering of an old stone building for one of her classes. Her name was Claire, the class was architecture. Their collision marked the beginning of a love affair that lasted just a few short years, but of a career for Robert that lasted a lifetime. Everything that was unattainable and wrong in his work as a sculptor was uncannily right in his work, first as a student, then apprentice architect, as if some slight but fatal flaw in his eye or his compass had been corrected. For this he credited Claire, she was his first great love. Through her, her, he found his calling. Through her, he learned, not incidentally, how sweet and vivifying love could be. She restored his confidence. She invigorated him and inspired his earliest work. In the brief time they were together, she gave him everything it seemed a man could want. And when at length she left him, citing his self-centeredness and preference for work over her, she gave him something new, the devastating, the devastating side of love, the heartache and the sorrow. For what she said was true, he had poured his love for her into his work to a fault, neglecting the real live person. It was a terrible mistake which he vowed never to repeat. He had a contempt for mistakes, rivaled only by, as an inspiring young architect, his contempt for repetition. After Claire left, he had an awful time. Guilt, anger, loneliness, self-recrimination, despair, the usual stuff. 
He couldn't work and that was worst of all because his career was just beginning and he needed work to feel like a man, to feel worth anything. And then in a freak accident, he lost an eye and what had seemed bad suddenly got worse. An architect without an eye? How about a bird without a wing? A singer without a throat? He felt castrated. He couldn't see or thought he couldn't see. Everything seemed flat and drab and lifeless. There were ways to adjust and compensate, but he wasn't into adjustment, not just yet. He was into bitterness and self-pity, which were new to him and gave him a kind of poisonous satisfaction. It was during this time that he met Julian Tabors, a bioengineer and fledgling entrepreneur, and they began a collaboration that was to culminate in the, event in the invention of Pachyflex, the so-called living skin. But that was years away, and at the time there was a qu real question just how long Robert would last. He was working for a firm, but his work was uninspired. He was getting stress-induced rashes, which itched and boiled and crawled along his skin. At length, he was put on notice as a poor performer, but he couldn't seem to correct himself. With each passing month, the world of architecture, which he adored, seemed to slip further from his grasp. Then he met Felicity, who changed his life. Felicity was an oculist, which was a little like being a jeweler. She had long, expressive fingers, slate blue eyes, and a sweet, ironic laugh. She gave Robert not his first fake eye, but his first good one that didn't announce itself from a mile off, bulging from its socket, making him look bug-eyed and cartoonish, or half bug-eyed, which was worse. He developed the habit of averting his face or alternatively whipping off his omnipresent sunglasses and confronting strangers, forcing them to choose where to look and where not to look, willfully inviting their uneasiness, fascination, and disgust. These were angry, spiteful days, and Felicity put them to rest. It was a matter of craftsmanship, which he had in abundance, but equally it was a matter of caring and empathy, of listening to a client, connecting with him, giving him the look, the picture of himself he wanted. Felicity had that talent too, and Robert fell for her like a fish for water. The day she gave him his eye in a little box, then helped him put it in, then stood beside him at the mirror, proud, almost protective, he was overcome with emotion. He asked if he could see her again. Gently, she refused. He asked if he, if he could at least call her, and she gave him her business card and said if he was having trouble with his eye, of course. He waited two weeks, then made an appointment. She made some minor adjustments, and a month later, he was back again. Eventually, against her better judgment, she agreed to go out on a date with him. He took her home and showed her the design of a building that he professed she had inspired, a frothy concoction of steel and glass, his first new design in many moons. She didn't quite know what to make of it, nor of his attention. He seemed so needy, starved for something she was not at all sure that she or anyone could provide. At the same time, she was flattered. Several weeks later, he showed her another building, also inspired by her, then another, and so it went until at length he wore her down, overcoming her resistance. He was only a man, after all, and if he insisted that she was heaven on earth, who was she to disagree? Putting weariness aside, burying suspicion, she stopped withholding herself, and from there the laws of chemistry, physics, and biology, which in the absence of compelling, compelling forces to the contrary, favored attraction, kicked in. She was already in some ways attached to him, and now that attachment grew. She looked forward to his company. She cared how he felt. And eventually the day arrived when she could no longer deny, nor had any wish to deny, that as near as she could tell, she was in love. It was evident in every facet of her life, at work, on the bus, on the street, in the kitchen, in bed. Robert was as fine a lover as she had known, attentive, responsive, creative, energetic, kind. 
Unlike many men, he did not despise or fear women, but rather he exalted them, on the whole a more forgivable offense. Felicity was sun and moon to him, and when they were together, he couldn't get enough of her, which made up for his tendency to be with her rather less now that she desired him than she would have liked. Thanks to her, his career was on the upswing. The draught of ideas had ended, the rashes too, and he was now working for himself, working feverishly, frequently missing meals and spending the night and sometimes two or three nights on end at the office. Six months after they moved in together, he won his first major commission, and in quick succession, several more, each of which, re which required that he travel. Not uncommonly, he was gone for a week at a time. As his business grew, his travel time increased until he was away nearly as much as he was home. By this point, the press had caught wind of him, the one-eyed architect, in their thirst for copies suggesting that his missing eye conf conferred a singular and authentic vision, like an extra sense. <clears throat> Privately, he would never submit to such nonsense. Publicly, he was shrewdly dismissive. Celebrity agreed with him and was good for business. He gave interviews. Clients flocked to him. Taxis, airports, and his drafting table saw more and more of him. Felicity, less and less. His love for her never wavered but it was subsumed by a greater love, and she learned how it felt to be demoted. From sun and moon she went to being but a planet, sometimes visible, sometimes not, like Venus or Mercury. And like Venus and Mercury, she had no moons to orbit her, and none on the way, because Robert didn't want any. And so after many years together, she left him, and for the second time in his life he was alone. For a while he did all right. Professionally he was thriving and he had the occasional fling. In addition, the long collaboration with Julian Tabors had finally reached fruition. Pachyflex was now on the market and it was revolutionizing the construction of buildings. A bioepidermic membrane applied to a matrix of polycarbon activating thread. The living skin took the place of traditional roofs and siding. It was responsive to the elements thickening in winter cold and summer heat, thinning in milder weather. It also changed color, both inside and out. Its exterior surface responded to ambient temperature and light. Its interior, interior if desired, to the prevailing moods of the building's inhabitants. Neither surface required a protective coating, be it shingle, tar, slate, tile, or paint, which was a big money saver. It was flexible, it was durable, it was economical, but its biggest selling point was that it mended itself. The dome home, an award-winning, one-of-a-kind trophy home topped by a soaring, onion-scaped, packy-flex dome, which Rob, Robert designed and built for a wealthy patron of the arts, was a consummate example of the product's strengths. It was also an example hitherto unknown of its weaknesses. Pachyflex was composed in part of cells, living cells, as living cells were needed for it to work its magic. The cells, the immunocompetence of these cells had been enhanced, which protected the material from outside attack or incursion. But as enhanced immune cells, they were also prone to attacking themselves and damaging the material. Three months after moving in, on the night of a banquet to entertain their hundred closest friends and celebrate their newest acquisition, the proud owners of the dome noticed a small bubble in it. Over the course of the evening, the bubble grew and slowly filled with a pale yellow fluid which, save for its size, bore a remarkable resemblance to a blister. By the time dessert was being served, a frothy concoction of meringue and whipped cream, the blister encompassed most of the ceiling. The gracious guests, fearful of sliding their host, did not begin to flee until the fluid began to drip, and most 
mercifully, were well on their way when, with a groan, followed by a deep bassoon-like ripping sound, the waters of the blister burst. As one of the departing guests ruefully remarked, it was as if, as if the house, mimicking the inaugural mood within it, were giving birth. In the succeeding weeks, other reports trickled in of ceilings and roofs that puckered, but also fissured, ulcerated, and cracked, of walls and siding that peeled, scaled, and sloughed off in fat, translucent flakes. The living skin was acting, it appeared, as skin did. Troubled skin, that is. It seemed to require prolonged daily contact between its residents and the material, which is why the effect had not been noted sooner. The first lawsuit was settled out of court. The remainder lumped into a class action suit, dragged on for years, and ultimately came near to bankrupting poor Robert. Far worse, though, was the damage to his reputation. In professional circles where the only thing more enjoyable than one's own success was a rival's fall from grace, Pachyflex became known as Fairchild's Folly. He lost business, he lost face. The rashes and welts that had plagued him earlier in his life returned with a vengeance. It's a common truth that misfortune causes some to rise, others to crack. Robert experienced a slow, steady, painful decline. He tried to work, but instead found himself staring at the wall or out the window of his office at the city far below his city, bustling with the construction of new buildings, fine buildings, but none of his buildings. He stared and wondered what had happened, how he had ended up here in this gloomy, sad, unfortunate, and unproductive place. More to the point, how could he get out? The work he'd done, the joy and the pleasure of it, and the recognition he'd received seemed of a different life and time. He had dreams of Claire and of Felicity, and he would wake from them feeling old and tired, like a building past its prime. But every so often he would have a different dream, with a different woman in it, nameless, faceless even, but nonetheless familiar to him, the way a certain childhood scent is familiar, deep beneath the skin familiar, rudimentary, intense, longed for, yet unknown. These dreams were like whispers, flickers in the dark, and he would often wake from them with a glimmer of hope. And in time, after a number of such dreams, it occurred to him what should have been obvious before. He needed help, not to put too fine a point on it, but he needed a woman. In the past, it had never been hard for him to meet women, and it wasn't hard now. Women liked him. And what was not to like in a man so charming, so attractive, so victimized by circumstance, and so willing to put it all behind and reestablish himself? Above all, he liked women as opposed to disliking them or, or distrusting them or, God forbid, despising them, which for many women was a disincentive to forming a relationship with a man. Robert not only liked the idea of women, he liked the fact of them. He liked to be around and beside them and face to face with them. He liked their company, their loving nature, their adaptability, their strength, their subtlety of thought. Women were the brick and mortar, the bedrock of his world. Every woman was beautiful to him, each in her own unique and special way. Throughout his life, had been this had been a constant, a source of pleasure and comfort to him, as dependable as breathing or as thought, or it had been. Now, strangely, this was not entirely the case. Something, it seemed, to change. Their beauty was still there, but it was beauty in the broad sense, the general sense, the way a forest was beautiful or a field of waving grass was beautiful, whereas any single tree or stalk on close inspection might be flawed. He met women and to his dismay noticed first and foremost their imperfections. This one was too loud, this one too quiet, this one too tall or too short, too bossy, too brassy, too shy. It was as if his vision had changed again, suddenly and inexplicably, so that instead of seeing with one eye, he was seen with less than an eye. He was seen through a veil 
he was seen wrong. He searched for reasons why. He changed his diet. He started exercising more. He visited a health food store and left with a CD of excruciating postures and meditative chants along with an armful of pills. He tried everything he could think of and looked everywhere except one place. And then one night he looked there where a good many others had looked before him and a few had even survived the mirror. What he saw was a man in his late thirties, a handsome man with a thick head of hair, strong chin, expressive lips, and a puzzled, somewhat desperate look on his face. The look was centered in his eyes, whose incongruity had long since grown accustomed to, but which now seemed new and disturbing, as though they were at odds with each, with each other, in conflict, the one dull and imbecilic, the other bright and accusatory, Although the more he looked, the more it seemed to be the reverse, that the fake eye was boring into the good eye, the true one, challenging it to see clearer, to see better, to see properly. He thought of work which had given him such pleasure in the past and which now was so problematic. He thought of Felicity and Claire, both of whom had left him because of his inability to find the proper balance between work and love, or more precisely between love of work and love of them. A fine distinction, love he had found did not parcel out easily. When it flowed, it had a tendency to overflow. It spilled from one cup effortlessly into another. When there was love, there was enough for all. At least that had been his experience, but not theirs which made him wonder if perhaps he was confusing love with something else. Euphoria, hunger, self-indulgence. Perhaps he had loved not too much, but too much on his own terms. It was humbling, especially because he never intended to cause hurt or suffering, but it did seem to happen and it hurt him in return. And if he could have changed, he would have. And now by a stroke of luck or fate, it seemed he had. Finding fault with women was a way to keep from getting involved with them. It was a way to protect them from him, the moral equivalent of wearing a condom. A man had to feel good about wearing a condom. He had to feel good about having morals. And Robert did. Unfortunately, there was still the problem of being unable to work of lacking motivation, inspiration, and desire. And to that there seemed but one solution. For while men were the builders, women were the miracle workers. And so he pressed on. The weeks went by. And eventually, after disappointment and despair, <laughs> Julian took him aside. There was only so much a friend could take before intervening. Julian said to him, I know a guy, a guy. He used to work in the lab next to me. Then he did big things with a startup that they had a falling out. Now he works for himself, bit of an oddball. Didn't used to be, but who cares? He knows what he's doing. What's that? He's a parthenogenesist. Good God, thought Robert, had it come to that. The idea had crossed his mind, but it seemed too dangerous and risky. It also raised questions about his own august self. In a word, it was humiliating. I don't think so, Julian. Why not? He listed his reasons. Julian suggested that he was overreacting. The process succeeded much more often than not, though of course there were no guarantees. Robert was skeptical. He was also intrigued. Does he have a catalog? No, no catalog. But he has his own line. Julian shook his head. He only does custom work like you. He's not into mass production. Not exactly like me. Julian shrugged. Build a house, build a man. And Robert thought, why not? He'd give it a try. He'd make a man, by which, of course, he meant a woman. What did he have to lose? So I'm going to stop there. Thank you so much for listening. That's kind of the setup of this long, long story. So he sets about to make the woman of his dreams. And uh, it goes from there.
thanks so much for your listening to me. Yeah, and and do a Q and a we're going to do a little talking now, I think. I want to say that when I, um, the other challenge was that there were so many stories I wanted to read from, and I, I actually chose four different ones because they were they all, and I didn't know what to do. Really couldn't decide. And there are not only from this, but in this or the other collection that's on sale here. There's an essay. I don't. I've written a little nonfiction, not too much, but I, I did write an essay um, that, that I really like. And I, anyway, I was trying to decide. And then I had dinner with uh, Chris and I and Augustina, Chris's wife. We all had dinner last night. Now, if you know them, you know that Augustina's an architect. Well, I said, I wrote a story about an architect. So that helped a lot. Thank you, Augustina. <laughs> Soon to be seen in Austin, there'll be bu buildings with pus forming blisters <laughs> <laughs> over the diners. Look at, I think they're making now some living memories. I wrote this. I, tell me I'm wrong. You're not going to tell me I'm wrong. <laughs> so you got to be the only writer <coughs> I know who has the nerve to edit his own or her own story in the while reading it. Uh, and one that has been uh, a bit in the past before uh, before you picked it up to read it again, yeah. um, but it's sort of unsurprising in a way. Thanks. Now the the Roberts, am I right that uh, without uh, spoiling that that the uh, the artificial being created in that story then goes on to create her own artificial partners? Is there something yeah, like that? Yeah, sort of like a, a, a layers of mirror. What's that? You know, when you when you're in a yeah, infinite the mirrors when you have two mirrors and you're trying on <laughs> clothes and, and you, do, you, you go on for a turn. Yeah, well he goes on in this story, he goes on, uh, he meets this kind of eccentric scientist about who, who can, can make people, but it's a grueling process and I mean, stop for a minute, imagine if you were asked to make your dream companion, that's not so easy, you know, I mean, it's really hard to do, and so. But his main goal was to make a, a person, th first and foremost, that wasn't hurt by him, by his eccentricities, because he kept doing this thing over and over. So he set about to make a woman that he both loved, but who loved him despite himself, and uh, he succeeded beyond his wildest dreams. And, uh, yeah. So you, Twists you, and twists. It's a fun story. So, so you come to writing fiction as a scientist, as a physician. If I were to like describe in one word kind of what it is you're writing about and something that runs through all of your work, I feel, is that you're writing about life. And you, you look at life with the clear some people would call it cold, some people would call it warm eye of a physician, of a scientist who understands it at all of its levels, um, of, a, of an eye grounded in a scientific understanding of the world. Why then did you choose the, the fantastic mm -hmm. as a mode of talking about these things that you care about so much? Because those would seem to be a kind of a fundamental opposition or at least tension. Yeah, yeah. Well, I think that came, they came kind of together. I was, I didn't choose it, it kind of chose me. I was always, uh, I was always asking what if, and that's in science fiction, that's the question. What if this could happen? What if this could, you're not satisfied with, with it now and uh, with the way things are. You want to imagine something wilder and more exciting. and. Uh, in time, I started imagining things that, have, in many cases, stuff that I wrote about have come to pass 20 or 30 years later that I was just sort of goofing on before. A lot of, I've written a lot about genetics, which is something that's been a lifelong passion, interest, and a lot of that now, I mean, if you know even a little bit about genetics, you know we can just do almost just about anything. <laughs> scarily, but excitingly too. Um, and a psychological way to answer that question is that um, 
the writing about the fantastic allow, allows you to put a little distance to things that you may be not sure about, that you may be embarrassed about, that um, you may want to explore. But you can always say, well, that's not me. That's not me. You know Austin Powers? Anyone see that first movie? You know when he, when they <laughs> he has a, like an inflatable penis or something, like some, because he's impotent or something like that. And, <coughs> And they find, and they, he's going through customs, and they find it. He says, that's not me, that's not mine, that's not mine. Anyway, the fantastic is, uh, is, is a way to do that. So it's safe, in a certain sense. But I think for me, that, I wasn't that interested in safe. I wasn't too worried about uh, repercussions. It's really fun to write about what, what uh, might be. And, uh, and imagine how things can be better or worse. I mean, we all do that, or just different. And uh, that's it's kind of been with me um, forever, since I can remember as a kid. But um, not, I'll say this, you know, you were talking about being a doctor and uh, When you, as a doctor, you have to be very grounded in, in the real, in what's there. And uh, you have to be, you have to be at, at the same, at simultaneously very detached and appeal to what you know scientifically and completely engaged with who's in your office with you because you want to connect and that's that's the high point of being a doctor is really connecting with uh, with who comes in and you may not think of doctors having imaginations that's maybe not what you want in the doctor <laughs> but in fact for, in my career it's served me really well because early on um, I thought outside the, the outside the box of conventional medical thinking in a way that just seemed um, uh, reasonable. So very, 40 years ago, people would come and I, with stuff and I would say, well, have you seen a chiropractor? Have you taken herbs? Or what about massage, you know? And, and I mean, that just seems normal to us now. And it's just, or, uh, or an osteopath. But back then, no, you couldn't, I, I didn't say that outside the, uh, the office, because people would just roll their eyes at me. You know? So it helps, even as a, as a scientist, um, to really be willing to uh, be creative. I have a one, here's a great example about creative kind of thinking. And I, I don't, it wasn't even me who did it. I had a patient years ago who had diabetes. And, uh, uh, and at the time, there were two, stop me if I'm going off, you know, at the, there are two kinds of diabetes at the time. That's how we were thinking of it. Still true slightly. There were um, people who got diabetes genetically, usually, well, not, forget the genetics, usually at a young age, they needed insulin. So these we called insulin dependent diabetics. And then there were, there was another kind, usually at a slightly overaged. Many of the people were overweight or they were eating badly. And these we called adult onset diabetics. And for the treatments were very different. The insulin-dependent diabetes, they needed insulin. Without insulin, they died or they had a lot of trouble. For the other people, you never gave insulin to them. They had to lose weight and they took certain pills to govern their sugar metabolism. So I had a guy who had adult onset diabetes and he came to me and he just wasn't doing well. And then he had a little stroke. Um, he was in pain constantly. He had a little stroke, which incidentally, <laughs> The stroke happened, it, this, it was the tiniest stroke you can imagine, and it happened in the part of the brain that knocked out his pain um, wow. uh, consciousness. So he was out of pain, and I was saying, oh, whoa, let's bottle that, but that, we couldn't do that. Anyway, <laughs> at a certain point, he said, well, I want to try insulin. And I said, you, 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 you can't try it. You have adult onset diabetes. He said, well, why not? And I said, well, because uh, <laughs> the university where I went, you know, the books, the journals, the, it, you don't do it. He said, I want to try it. So I finally said, okay, let's try it. Five years later, it became standard treatment, or 10 years later. Oh yeah, we should give a little insulin to everybody. So 
just an example of, uh, in this case, listening to people with crazy ideas and uh, taking them seriously when, when they make some sense. Did you use your storytelling capabilities in your practice as a physician? No, no, rarely. No, I listened. You listened? Yeah. You know, I never, uh, I was of the school that uh, peop when, when people are worried or in pain or have questions, that's the, their world is, is very much centered around that and they don't want to hear anything. <laughs> they just want help. And, and it was also a sort of, more, sort of an ethical decision that they did not need to know anything about me. They, all they need to know was that I was there to help them. And so I didn't really talk about myself. At the very end, the last one or two years, I started to talk about my, myself a little more, just just because I was going to stop. And, and I, I started changing, and the boundaries kind of shifted. And that was also wonderful, because people people responded to some, some of the stuff I said, but still, bottom line, people go to a doctor because they want help and they don't really want to hear about anything else. So that was my instinct and it was the right one. Yeah. There's a, there's a strong political current, I feel like, that runs through your work as well. And I know from our past conversations that you kind of even before you became a physician and before you came, became a writer, you were involved in sort of radical politics. And um, I wonder, how, I mean, medicine, a lot of us don't think of as an intrinsically uh, political milieu. Uh, science fiction, a lot of us don't think of as an intrinsically political milieu. Why do you, how do you feel like, um, your political interests and your sense of justice. Uh, how does your your how do your how does your fiction sort of help you, um, or do you think it helps you sort of achieve what you think your goals are and as a as a political actor? Or maybe just how do you feel about the role of politics in your work and how it kind of brings together these parts of your life? Mm -hmm. Well, I was always yeah I was a radical kind of, in the 60s, ev everyone I knew was radical in the 60s. <laughs> I got thrown out of college for sitting in for those, those reasons. Um, and it was the, it was the uh, civil rights was big, anti-war movement, that's why I came of age. But where I really came of age political-wise was in the feminist the second wave of feminism, the feminist movement, and we, we called it women's, the women called it women's liberation, women's liberation movement. And, and so a lot of m the politics in my, that comes out of my writing is, uh, is around uh, gender equality and the issues around gender. Uh, I worked on a campaign, when was this, in the 80s? or 90s? There was a campaign to keep gay teachers from being able to teach in elementary schools called the Briggs Initiative, I think, yeah. And I worked on to f defeat that, and it was defeated, luckily, nicely, well. Um, I don't think it's a ro for me, I, a lot of my writing b is political. My novel, The Healer, is about an under, uh, an oppressed minority uh, of ugly people who happen to have the capability of being great he healers. So they're at the same time the most despised and downtrodden, but they're also, they're the only hope for people who are sick. So it's kind of this funny, uh, this funny mix. And I named him Pain, the main character in the healer, just thinking that pain, you know, pain and suffering and stuff. And, the, and it was reviewed by the Annals of Internal Medicine, which is one of the like, <laughs> how wonderful, it was great. And he, uh, and there's revolution in the book and there's all sorts of political stuff and the, uh, the main character tries out all sorts of ways to change his oppressive world. And the reviewer uh, just assumed that, uh, that I was talking about Thomas Paine 
who was a, you have to remind, he was like in, in revolutionary America, right? He yeah, was, he was got writing, jailed in the French Revolution. Right, too, broadsheets yeah. and stuff. And, I, and that had never occurred to me, you know. I, um, but a lot, and, and I've written direct, my Reagan story, you know, you mentioned, that uh, was very upset. I couldn't get that published in the United States because it was, uh, people couldn't, didn't want to touch a story where Ronald Reagan is not the hero of the world. And, but I, it came out in England and it, it put me on the map, you know, in, in a way. Uh, so I don't set out to write them at some, like that one, I just was so pissed off at Ronald Reagan. He just closed all the mental health hospitals in California and sent all these sick, poor people out on the streets. And I was, it was just, that was, you know, and then he did lots of other things. I was so pissed. So I wrote this, the, to me, which was a very funny story, <laughs> um, <laughs> but it's sort of dark, black humor. You have to like black humor. And, uh, and that happened again. I, I, then George W. w Bush, he was totally pissing me off. So there's another story in here addressed to George Bush. Which story is that? Uh, it's called Strategy for Conflict Avoidance, okay. Memo to the Commander-in-Chief. <laughs> um, yeah, and it's a story about ants, watching, being outside watching ants. It's about a story about paying attention to, to, what, to the natural world, to really what is. So it's all about this. This week I spent out on, in the uh, Point Reyes riding and, and I took walks and, and I just really got into the natural world. And when you get into it, you start seeing things that you, that, you don't, that you don't see if you're just walking through. And then you see something and if you take a little longer, you see something else. And your, your, your perceptions keep deepening, deepening. And, uh, it, and that happened to me there, and it was, it was mainly just telling him, you know what, don't just talk and froth at the mouth. Just pay attention and be real, you know. It was sort of an innocent <laughs> call for him to be real. Anyway, so that was that, that story. And through the lens of what I love, which is the natural world and uh, observation. Yeah, well, we, that, that's something we share and we've talked about. Yeah, and yeah. One of the most amazing pieces of nature writing, of unexpected nature writing I've read recently is the title essay in your collection Thoreau's Microscope, which is part of the PM Press Outspoken Authors series, a really beautiful collection. And that's a, an essay about, in part, about you and some friends going out into the Sierras, as I guess you have done, you know, on an annual basis. And there you name, named a mountain after a Thoreau. But in the middle of that essay, you also write about your own cancer almost as like a mode of lyrical nature writing and about the beauty of the cancer cells that you're dealing with and um yeah Let me what's <laughs> that like kind of trying to write about your own body as a kind of nature writing or well this talk is about the first the beauty of the thing that's this isn't you. the first essay but it's that i almost read from this because it's i love i love this essay so about four or five years ago this we've I've gone up to the Sierras my whole life, and I'm a big outdoor backpacker and mountain climber. And, um, and so someone in the Sierras, every mountain's named after somebody. Uh, John Muir, Charles Darwin, Lamarck, uh, uh, Emerson, you know, the list goes on and on, but there wasn't any mountain named after uh, Henry David Thoreau. Which, who's arguably the father of, of, of or he's very, very central in the American nature movement or uh, history. And, uh, and someone noted, noted that and said, let's go find a mountain. Well, there, there was an unnamed mountain, um, happened to be right opposite Mount Emerson with Thoreau and Emerson were friends and they were right across from each other. So they said, well, let's just go up and name it. Well, there's a whole story that's in that, I don't talk about it, but there's a, other people do. You can't name mountains anymore. It's, that's part of wild, keeping them wild and unnamed, blah, blah, blah. So that's a really interesting part of the story. But anyway, we went up, poets, uh, Gary Snyder, who's a poet, Stan Robinson, who's another science fiction writer, some other writers, photographers, artists, and we climbed this unnamed mountain over two days. 
and we put a box up and we said, Mount Thoreau, you know, and then we climbed down and we partied. And it was totally great and fun. And at the party we read Thoreau, we read stuff we had, the photographers showed their photography, the artists showed their art. And then we went home, but um, it was so much fun that one of the organizers said, geez, we can't let this die. How about we do a book? And so, and people had already uh, uh, done stuff for the, uh, for the party, so it was easy. And then, but for me, it was like, well, I have a lot more to say. So I wrote a, another essay. I read something at the party. And the essay is there. And the essay is really about, um, it's about a lot of things. But for me, climbing this mountain, um, I'd always climb mountains. And I loved it. And I was going to be with kindred spirits and friends. And a year before, I had been diagnosed with lung cancer, and I had first one lobe of a lung, we had five lobes, and I had one lobe removed, and I had a second lobe removed. So I was kind of down on the lobes, and uh, I didn't know if I could get back to the mountains again. And uh, so it was a chance to find out if I could, and the mountain, this mountain's 12,000 feet, it's not like a, a, a shorty. But I did, and it was amazing, and I was just so happy and grateful. And so I came down, and I wanted to write about Thoreau, and so a lot about, about Thoreau. Well, Thoreau, Thoreau is an amazingly um, great writer, and if you like reading, you like poetry, and you like observation science, I recommend him. And he wrote uh, extensively, 6,000 pages of journal entry. Anyway, but he didn't write much about um, he, his health, and he died at a young age of tuberculosis, as many people did back then. He was 40, in his 40s. His sister died of it also. And um, that was a little curious to me, although he came of a different time. He was a New Englander. New Englanders are kind of traditionally um, close-lipped when it comes to talking about those kind of matters, but I'm not. I, I'm not at all. And to me, this was like a springboard to sort of talk about what I'd gone through. And I'd kept a journal while I'd uh, had my, I'd been hospitalized, and uh, and I, it, it was the first time in a real way I'd ever been on the other side. I'd been a doctor for many years, but I never really, I've been a patient briefly, but never like that, where I'm really, you know, lying in bed, helpless, with drugs going. And that was really interesting to me to kind of document what that was like. Now, um, uh, so they took out my, one of my, my lung, uh, these lobes, and I, I asked if I could keep it. <laughs> well, you're not allowed to keep your body parts. I don't know if you know that. It, it, they're, they're yours while they're on you, but once they're off, forget it. They're not yours, unless you do it in private and keep them at home. Um, I kind of knew this, but I had to ask. And my daughter, who didn't know, it was incensed. She thought, it's your body. Well, um, but they do um, let you have the thin slices that they put on slides that look at under the microscope. Um, they don't let you have it, but you can borrow them. And so I took these. That's what they look at, to look and see what you got. Is it a cancer? How, what kind? Of, how big is it? Where is it going? You know, bad? OK. So um, I got those. I got those slides. And, uh, and I took them to a guy I knew who was like the, the leading lung pathologist in uh, Northern California. So he was a guy I knew at the university that I worked. And, uh, <coughs> I was still recovering, and uh, he, he, he was so great. He was just a great guy. He worked in this tiny office, just the kind I love, you know. It was the messiest place you can ever imagine. Books everywhere. I just felt so at home, because that's how, that's what I love. And so he's there, and he was just so um, welcoming, and he had a, 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 a teaching microscope which has, had actually three pair of eyepieces, but there was just the two of us. So he's sitting there, and I'm sitting there, and we go through one slide after another. And uh, it was just amazing to me. It threw me back to my days as a, a medical student, which was many, many years earlier, when I was looking at cancer. And cancer um, is different, looks different. And I learned to, um, I, I, so this, a normal cell, there are lots of different cells, but a normal cell is, uh, say that's the, um, the surface, the membrane of the cell. These are in two dimensions, so they're not 
you're looking just two-dimensionally. So it's a big circle, say that's the cell membrane, and then there's the nucleus, which is usually pretty small, and then there's the cell cytoplasm all inside. But a cancer cell is really different. The, the, um, the nucleus is really huge because these cells are dividing actively, and that's where the division is, takes place initially. So they look like big, fat, dark eyes. And when you look at a cell and you see a bunch of cells like that, you know that that's cancer. Well, until you know it's cancer, you just look and say, oh, that's kind of interesting, beautiful. But if you look at them enough, which I had done as a student, you start associating sinister things with these cells. So I knew when I saw my cancer cell that that was cancer and my heart dropped. You know, I knew I had cancer already, but it was like this old kind of reflex. But um, that day was just one of the best days of my life because I felt like I, there I was uh, in my milieu, seeing life, learning again with this great pathologist, doing what I love to do and seeing nature. And thinking about, you know, cancer, you think about cancer, the big C, it's just an awful thing. And, uh, you know, as I write in the essay, it's no picnic having cancer, but if you're going to have it, but the next best thing to having it is thinking about it. Or not the next best thing. It's no picnic <laughs> having it, but if you're going to have it, you might as well be allowed to think about it. And think, thinking about cancer, there's not much that's better than that because cancer is really life. You know, it's not an enemy. Cancer is, we used to think it was something that, that came from outside and, and uh, took us over and, and parasitized us, but it's not, it's us just going a little awry. And, uh, you know, now we know so much more and we're going to have cure. We already have cures for much of it. And by the time the young people in this audience are my age, cancer will be a chronic disease. It'll just be a chronic disease like other diseases. Um, and that's happening already for some kinds of cancer. Anyway, it's just so thinking about cancer is like thinking about life and what makes life and what makes the body work. So that was the experience I have. And so I write about that. That's part of it. It's a beautiful It's also thinking about dying, and so it's not all fun and games. But uh. <laughs> it's, a, it's a beautiful <laughs> essay. One other piece of nature writing of a sort that you mentioned in, as you were introducing your, your, uh, the piece you read from, is the story Paul and Me, yeah. which is one you turned me on to, which is a story about a man who has a, a uh, a gay love affair with Paul Bunyan, um, a very different kind of story than a, than a nature essay about cancer. <laughs> but it's a curious thing to me, uh, again, for somebody who comes at this from the perspective of a science, as someone who writes almost a kind of biopunk with this kind of eviscerating, gritty, fearless yeah. attack that you, you look it's to almost. these kind of almost like folkloric stories and these classic stories to to find your way to things like talking about cancer is life, and um, maybe talk about why do you go to these? Uh, how do you how do you go to these sort of ur sources of story of these like folkloric um, uh, precedents as a way to tell these yeah. uh, kind of penetrating and very different sorts of stories? That's a great good question. Yeah. Well, I. I I grew up on fairy tales and folk stories, so that was part of my, my upbringing. And my mom was a great reader, and I read. I, thought, I didn't read a lot, but when I read, it was mostly that kind of those kind of things. So I knew about Paul Bunyan and Calamity Jane, who I guess was real, Pecos Bill and John Henry, and uh, I Paul <laughs> Paul. What I thought later when I uh, when I put together this, uh, the, the uh, publisher asked me to just to write a little bit about the story. <laughs> so, I, so I wrote a little bit and when I was starting writing about Paul and I started seeing him again and, and I, uh, it occurred to me that he was very much like village people. I don't know if you know the village people. <laughs> they sang YMCA. There were these gay guys, you know, but each one, this guy was a telephone uh, repair man, and this guy was uh, like a construction worker. construction worker. So they all had these things, and Paul was like a logger, and he sort of. But um, but again, it, it's a story about about gender. I was experimenting sexually at the time, um, and and San Francisco 
and AIDS was happening, and I was seeing AIDS people with AIDS, and uh, and it seemed. I, I never said I have to write this, but it was just part of the world we were living in. People were dying, and, and so this is a, this is dedicated to a, a friend of mine, a, a, a great science fiction writer who died of AIDS, um, and uh, so it's trying. Oh, it's so sad, you know. So it's a love story. It's a love story to him. It's, it's a, and it's a, it's a, it's it's a, it's a sad story of, of of people who you love that don't live. Yeah. <laughs> but it's a, it's also a beautiful story because before they die, they love, and we all die, and so we cherish what we have when when we can. And and a lot of this story is of this vitality of this great mythic legend of America. He's just so vital and he just embodies the, the world of, of many things. But uh, to me, he embodies life itself. And this, this guy is wandering around and he's kind of adrift and he meets this man who just sweeps him up in his, in his world. And it's just beautiful. And then the man uh, gets sick. And then, and then the, the roles change, and uh, they have to help each other. Thank you so much for coming. Michael, thank you. Thanks, Chris. All right. Thank you for being here. Thank, thank you all so much. Michael's books are available online or at your local independent bookstore. Learn more about Michael at michaelblumline.com. Special thanks to Malvern Books for hosting the event. With John Lubkowski, I'm Scoop Sweeney. This is the Plutopia News Network. 20 minutes into the future.